Dr. Robin Darling Young, who is Associate Professor of Church <coughs> History at the Catholic University of America. Uh, she has written, translated, and edited books and articles in the field of early Christianity in the East. She is currently translating or writing about selected works of Evagrius of Pontus. She is president of the North American Patristic Society. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll begin in the, in the way that is customary. Um, thank you to the hierarch, to Reverend Brothers and Sisters, um, and to colleagues, and also um, to students who are here, past and present. I'm actually filled with gratitude to see so many of um, what my main topic and obsession would call friends. Um, uh, Evagrius of Pontus, yes, I'll just say it right now. Uh, <laughs> um, Evagrius of Pontus um, said in more than one place, as he was inclined to do, uh, the friends of God are friends of one another. And so I'd like primarily to acknowledge you as friends. But I also want to say that I'm unbelievably grateful that one of my first, in fact, I think the for, in the very first class I taught, I have, there is a student of mine today, and that is my colleague, Carol Burnett, Monica Carol Burnett, who is here, uh, and who also works at Catholic University and has also taught patristics. And finally, one more, as my kids would say, shout out, um, and that is to the Sherman children. <laughs> um, and thank you for coming, because this reminds me of times when I, I brought my own children to class and then glared at them to remain silent the whole time. But you don't have to do that. Um, I have, to, I have to acknowledge two other people uh, who aren't here as far as I, well, I know one isn't, but um, one is uh, Father John Krisav Gies, for whom I'm standing in, my unworthy self is standing in. Uh, uh, you'll note that the topic of my paper is the ascetic inspection of nature, a, a um, title I have chosen, I hope, with sufficient care. Uh, this really was to be uh, Father Chris Avgis's subject, and it is his subject, um, but uh, he wasn't able to be with us, and so I'm standing in for him. I also like to acknowledge a challenge that I received yesterday from uh, Dr. Alice Mary Talbot, who said to me, um, you're not here, are you, Alice Mary? No. Okay. Uh, who said to me, did the monks really talk about nature? I can't find this in, in later monastic sources. And I confidently said, yes, of course they do. And um, then I realized she was right. And um, not so much, oops, sorry. Although I will have something to say ab about nature in monastic literature as I go along. Um, I want to begin, though, the, my real beginning, um, with a long quotation uh, from Evagrius uh, because it, I think it helps us focus precisely on what the inspection of nature is in um, early ascetic, and I, I choose that word deliberately, um, in early ascetic writings. So here we go. It's from his treatise on thoughts, number eight. It's fairly well known. Um, it's been quoted by other scholars and friends of mine. After lengthy observation, we have learned to recognize this difference between angelic and human thoughts and those that come from the demons. First, angelic thoughts are concerned with the investigation of the natures of things and search out their spiritual principles. For example, isn't he a pedant? Uh, dear to my heart, the reason why gold was made and why it is sand-like and scattered through the lower regions of the earth and is discovered with much labor and toil. How when it is discovered, it is washed and delivered to the fire and then placed in the hands of artisans who make the lampstand of the tabernacle, the incense burner, the censers and the vessels from which by the grace of the savior, the king of Babylon no longer drinks, but it is Cleopas who brings a heart burning with these mysteries. The demonic thought neither knows nor understands these things. But without shame, it suggests only the acquisition of sensible, aestheticos, gold, and predicts the enjoyment and esteem that will come from this. In the age of ol oligarchs, this hardly bears commenting. 
The human thought neither seeks the acquisition of gold nor is concerned with investigating what gold symbolizes. Rather, it merely introduces into the intellect the simple form of gold, separate from any passion of greed. The same reasoning can be applied to other matters by mentally engaging the exercise of this rule. I want to come back to this quotation at the end of my discussion. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, or uh, on, the way to, on the way to the end of the paper, I want to say that um, I, I believe that monastic and ascetic inspection of nature has been neglected in the scholarship on monasticism and asceticism from the 19th century when it really got going all the way up to uh, more or less um, the beginning of this century because... Uh, monasticism was treated by scholars of the 19th century either as a reforming impulse within the church of the ancient world, that monastic church versus imperial church that we heard about yesterday, um, or um, in the, again in the 20th century primarily as a discourse about sexual expression or sexual repression. Uh, a world denying, body negating, cultural stream of thought. Um, most recently, perhaps, in those inspired by the studies of Michel Foucault and the discipline of the self. Um, so that's a, a sort of critical stance, which has, I think, conditioned uh, or provided the conditions for neglect of uh, monastic inspection of nature. The other, um, the other um, approach to monasticism, which has conditioned this neglect, I think, is one that actually is very interesting, um, but it uh, tends to concentrate upon tales of monastics in nature. So, for instance, in the Historia Monacorum um, in Egypto, uh, in the Lives of the Desert Fathers, and similar works, uh, we find descriptions of monastics as having returned to paradise, as having, um, uh, uh, as being compatible with many animals that they encountered or with the natural world that they encountered once they were out of cities. And I brought a book up because, you know, I can't resist doing this. <laughs> I brought a book up which I think covers that all very well. I've recently reviewed it and it's very good, In the Eye of the Animal by Patricia Cox Miller where she has, in chapter four, wild animals, desert ascetics and their companions. So I refer you to this book for that, for that particular topic, um, seen through a certain interpretive lens, but still very useful. And I think I just want to pass over that and concentrate on the, the nature of and the origin of the ascetic inspection of the natural world, um, which really is a diadoche, that is, it, or diadoche, sorry, um, and that is a, um, a succession of teachers has provided by means of archives maintained in the ancient world, has provided a way that is built upon until it reaches um, uh, it reaches uh, learned ascetics a way of seeing the natural world. And so to employ a common expression now, there is a through line, that's a deal, okay, um, from Philo to Clement to Origen to the Cappadocians, particularly of ba uh, Basil and his well-known um, uh, homilies on the Hexaemeron, to Nemesius of Emesa, to Maximus, and finally to John, well, Maximus is later, but also to John Philoponus. All of these uh, represent a kind of diadoche of thinking about how to think about the natural world. There, everyone except, uh, everyone sort of before the fourth century form the cornerstone of Basil's homilies. Um, and, so, and so, in a way, I'm talking about a method more than contents. But I think the method itself is extremely important 
for forming what we will find later as an ascetic and then a monastic approach to the world. So I want to begin with Philo. And I'll add as an aside that in some audiences where when I talk about Evagrius, I will simply get the response, oh, that's all Philo, which seems to be uh, overstating the case. But he does make a very important move, um, apparently after his visit to Rome in the first century, where he incorporates Stoic philosophy and turns to the Timaeus to interpret the mosaic account of creation in a philosophical way. We don't have any time to account for that here, but we find Philo directly quoted in his successors in what becomes the Christian diadochi, that is, uh, Clement, Origen, and Evagrius. So if we turn to Clement's stromates, we find Clement, like Philo before him, appropriating Solomon as the primary inspector of the natural world. Why? Because Solomon was wiser beyond all men. Um, so, uh, uh, Clement says, says that, uh, that the logos has already indicated a means of knowing the world, which is called natural contemplation. Those who read of Agrius will recognize this immediately, which concerns all beings in the world of sensation. Kataton, esteton, kosman, apanton, ton, gegonaton. But to know this world, you need training. Meta orthis, politias, askithisa. You must be, you must receive the askesis of being able to look at the world in a certain way and see it as it really is. The training is not only an in individual, but a corporate way of life that leads a person who is so trained to wisdom, what Clement calls, or whom Clement calls, the technitido sophias, the, uh, it, to wisdom which is the ruler of all. Now, Clement has here alluded to a curriculum which he describes in his three volumes, uh, the uh, uh, Protrepticos, Pedagogos, and, and um, <laughs> I almost said Kephalionostica. No, the Stromates. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, and it is necessary to go through this entire curriculum to be able to see the natural world at all. Why does Clement do this? Um, Clement elaborates this curriculum against the dualists of his own day, who have rejected the world of bodies, the world of the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint in his case, in favor of a direct return out of bodies and a world construed as a prison to the transcendent one. And I think that uh, the best explanation I have found for what we use, usually call Gnosticism with a capital G, which rejects natural knowledge, is that it is a Christian reception of radically dualistic Platonism. Clement fought this in his own way by, of course, taking on uh, vast sections of Philo but himself also going through the Greek educational curriculum, including Aristotle, whom Lloyd Gerson has uh, included in a title of a, a wonderful book he wrote called Aristotle and Other Platonists, <laughs> and, and forging a Christian paideia, drawing on both Hebrew scriptures and Jewish philosophy, again, Philo, itself a kind of Platonism that had incorporated Aristotle and the Stoics in order, in Clement's mind, to prepare learned Christians to embrace the world created by God for the salvation of minds and to surpass it not in the dualist way, in the falsely so-called Gnostic way, but in the authentic way of true knowledge, returning or enabling their return to their maker by contemplation. Now, when we think about these authors, I mean, and by we, I mean a large tradition of scholarship, we often want to get to 
the contemplation of God uh, and leave aside attention to what our authors say about what we would call the natural world or natural philosophy. Um, but they, Clement, Origen, and Evagrius, and the monks after them who participate in that tradition, would be horrified at this attempt to leap into uh, what the, and I quote them here um, you know, advisedly, what the uh, later Latin sc scholastics would call the topic, the first topic in scholastic handbooks, De Deo Uno, the one God. So you, do, you cannot, for these teachers, you do not approach the contemplation of God without a proper understanding of nature, the natural world. Now, now uh, Clement, to return to our friend, regards Moses as the supreme teacher of wisdom. This is, possibly on, uh, this is possible only because he has become a friend of God. How did he become a friend of God? Through askesis. Clement perhaps draws upon a second temple tr Jewish tradition of Moses as an ascetic, a married man who forswear the, forswore sorry, the use of marriage bef after his encounter with the divine presence. Clement draws heavily on Philo, and he understands, Clement understands what he is doing as an elaboration of the Mosaic philosophy. I think we have to take this very seriously. And um, wound in with these ideas uh, are Clement's view, which is carried on by Evagrius and his tradition, Origen II, um, that Christ as high priest is the first of many brothers to enter the temple of God's wisdom. Um, now, in Stromate's Four, Clement alludes to a separate work of his on the cosmos in order to say what the Christian Gnosticos knows about nature. Did he ever write this work? Don't know. But if he did, his discussion of nature itself through the lens of the eyes of the friend of God is there. Uh, Clement has alluded to a, a, a couple of works of which there is no evidence, so um, we have to think that maybe he meant to do it. But he does describe physiologia as contemplation, epopteia, in which he insists, in Stromates IV again, that the study of cosmogony, the or origin of the cosmos, and the study of the, the world, cosmology, and everything in it leads to theology. Um, and he too, like Philo before him, was strongly attached to an elaboration of Plato's Timaeus. What is intelligible, noetikos, and what is perceptible, aestheticos, um, is founded in his understanding of Genesis 1, 1 through 3, which I don't have time to go into here, but I invite you to look it up. Um, and he embraces Plato, saying that in the Timaeus, he follows Moses, that scripture and Plato are in accord. God is a single principle in creation, and, and he, um, I'm sorry, that God creates only, it creates only through his will. Um, he roots his interpretation in the second letter of Plato, where God accomplishes creation through the Logos. Now, I, I point this out to show that through this diadochi, there is a constant effort to uh, incorporate Plato, and particularly, particularly the Timaeus, understood at, with Aristotelian inflection into an interpretation of scripture. And Origen follows in the wake of Clement, even though there's only one place I've ever found where Origen seems to refer to Clement. Um, but Origen himself, in On First Principles 236, understands the cosmos as the entire universe and everything existing in it all of which is superintended by God, assisted, of course, with angels who themselves are superintending delegates. 
He discusses the creation of matter and the shaping of matter. Matter is of such a nature as to underlie the arrangement of the world in an orderly and perceptible way. It has a rational nature, and here he quotes to me as 53. He says, and unfortunately we have this only in Latin, it is in this wisdom, the logos, that there exists every capacity and form of the future creation, both of the primary beings as well as of the secondary ones, which were fashioned and arranged by the power of foreknowledge. For in this wisdom are hosted and prefigured all created things. And this wisdom, speaking through Solomon, says that she was created as, quote, a beginning of the ways, unquote, of God, which means that she contains in herself the origins, the reasons, and the species of the entire creation. What, Origen says many times, accounts for disorder and evil in the created world, and I like to thank Despina for her um, discussion of evil in the previous paper that she gave, um, the choice, the choice of pre-existent rational souls, which, based on their choices as disembodied, will set them on their way to the embodied and visible worlds, which themselves are, or which itself, rather, is a, um, is, is for origin, as for Evagrius, a kind of hospital and schoolroom for the return to the one God. Now, Origen, as, uh, as people who read Origen know, is not as enthusiastic or as open in culling Greek philosophy as is Clement. Clement, uh, I believe, was the, f maybe it was Philo, <laughs> but at least I think Clement was the first Christian author to refer to Greek, phil uh, Greek philosophy, including its study of the natural world, as the spoils of the Egyptians. Um, uh, but... He does say, and I think this is really important in On First Principles, eager longing for the reality of things is natural to us, fusikos, and implanted in our souls. The mind burns with unspeakable longing to learn the design of those things which we perceive to have been made by God. Our mind cherishes a natural and appropriate longing to know God's truth and to learn the causes of things. Mind progresses from, and here's what I was talking about earlier, mind progresses from perception of the world to conception of God the Father, creator of all, beyond the world. But one can gain some notion of him from our experience of the visible creation and from the instinctive thoughts of the human mind. Now, we do actually find the distinction coming about later and in the medieval West of a, a, a distinction between the book of scripture and the book of nature. Um, both of them extremely important for creating an entire approach to God. But it's also to be found in a thinker that I couldn't deal with today, namely Ephraim the Syrian. Um, so this is a movement in the fourth century, not dependent, I think, um, upon Greek philosophy, although there's ongoing argument about how much Greek philosophy Ephraim knew, but it is an attempt to respond to and against the radical, selfish, and, uh, and world-denying uh, uh, stance of, on the one hand, uh, pseudonymous Gnostics, falsely so-called Gnostics, and on the other hand, those who accumulated wealth without thought for, um, for those, even those fellow Christians who uh, needed the aid that personal wealth could give. Now I turn to Evagrius again. <laughs> um, because the treatise on thoughts really is the place to find Evagrius's rationale for the contemplation and observation of nature. Evagrius claims a knowledge of physics in the ancient sense, but he never writes a separate treatise on the subject. I think he didn't have to because it was in his library written by other people. But he does talk about it in, from place to place. If anyone thinks it is unseemly to be in poor clothing, 
let him look at St. Paul, who awaited the crown of righteousness in cold and nakedness. But since the apostle called this world a theater and a stadium, let us see if it is possible, um, clothed in thoughts of anxiety, hint, it isn't, uh, to run toward the prize of the high calling of Christ or to fight against the principalities and powers and world rulers of this darkness. I, for my part, do not know, again, a counterfactual, even though I am learned in what pertains to sensible reality. He's pointing here to his education, of course. For clearly, that athlete will be hindered by his tunic and easily dragged about, just, uh, for, just as that. So also, the mind will be by thoughts of anxiety, even if indeed the saying is true that the mind is firmly attached to its treasure. For scripture says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The, the place to find much of Evagrius's thinking on the natural world, however, um, is not in his monastic works per se, but in a set of scolia on Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Psalms. And I'm happy to say that a translation of those scolia, I'm looking for the translator, is he here? Uh, no, perhaps not. A translation of those scolia will be uh, forthcoming in the next couple of years because they really do show us the foundation of uh, Evagrius' thought about the natural world and the human social world. And so I'm not going to quote, because I've reached the end of my time, from Evagrius' understanding of what Solomon has to say uh, in both uh, Ecclesiastes and Proverbs about realities, the natural world, and the approach to the national, natural world. Uh, but again, we see in these scolia that our understanding of the natural world around us is absolutely key for becoming what the ascetic tradition intends us to become, not only as a way of life, but as a way of thought, uh, and, uh, and, and how the ascetic contest is the only way to actually see the world as it really is. In Scolian 2, of, Scol of the Scolia on Ecclesiastes. Evagrius says, to those who are entering the intellectual church, uh, noeticos, or noetiki, and who are amazed by the contemplation of things which have come into being, the word, the logos says, do not think that this is the final end stored up for you in the promises. For all of these things are vanity of vanities in the face of the knowledge of God himself. So even though the natural world and its proper appropriation intellectually is of extreme importance, it's not the final goal. For just as medicines are vain after perfect health, thus also the logi of the ages and worlds, the reasons for everything in this room up, up, and up to the galaxy <laughs> are vain after the knowledge of the Holy Trinity. So Theoria Fusiki is extremely important. It's crucial. To see the world as it really is is crucial for the ascetic, for the monastic, but it is not the end. And I add here, why did Evagrius spend so much time in scattered ways, like Clement, talking about the natural world? And he tells us, actually, in Thoughts 28, why did the monks need to have knowledge of nature as it operated on various levels? Because of their students. He says, it's necessary to be able to have something to say about dreams and fantasies, those, those very fantasies that might lead us to think about acquiring gold instead of giving it to the artisans who place it in the noetic temple. 
Why? Not only because of the monks, he says, but because of the outsiders, all those that come from Egypt and also from abroad, drawn by our renown. Who are these outsiders? Not Xeni, but Kosmiki. And this shows how the diadochi that leads from, from Philo, I mean, from, excuse me, Plato through Philo, and then in the hands of these, this chain of teachers, including Basil and the Cappadocians, reaches the outside world. Thank you so much. Thank you.